name is Shalim Chakraborty and welcome again to the second episode of our podcast of Diversity and Equality. I'm here with my co-host and friend Rafael and Lupita. And today we have our guest Jackie, who's a professor at Reykjavik University. Um, Jackie, uh, would you like to give a short introduction of yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm a computer scientist professor. Um, I had a slightly different career to most professors in that I worked in industry for about 20 years and then came back to the academy. And I teach computer networks and computer security. And I have a sideline in annoying economists. I work in simulation models and I look at uh, simulating economic systems and the banking system. Okay, so um, you have been in the in the academic uh, let's say in the academic environment for a long time. So you were a student or you're a professor. So um, how how will you describe the let's say the growth of equality and diversity spreading throughout the years? Um, it's very different to when I started. Um, when I was a student at Loughborough University, which was in the 1980s. Um, there were four of us out of a hundred that were women on that course. And I think that's fairly typical for STEM at that time. And that was interesting, um, but it, it didn't bother us so much. I think, you know, we were very good friends and we were usually fairly close to the top of the class. So, you know, the, the boys were more of a distraction than anything else, I'm afraid, but, you know, um, I think when there's very small numbers of women, you know, it can actually be less of an issue than when there's larger ones. And, you know, it's changed definitely over the years. At, when I was at MIT in the early 2000s, in the undergraduate classes there, they were up to about 45% female. And that was an enormous change. And here in Iceland, obviously, it's also a fairly sizable percentage is female, which is great to see. Um, so definitely women are getting, you know, and a, and a lot of it, honestly, has been just access to education. Um, when I was choosing my undergraduate, you know, we were quietly and somewhat subtly steered away generally from STEM subjects, um, which I think is no longer the case. So it's, you know, that's a, an important component of all this. And, People um, should be allowed, sorry, go ahead. No, no worries, go ahead, please. Well, I feel, you know, people should be able to choose whatever to do whatever they want to do. And, you know, women and men, if they're interested in science, should be able to do it equally. And in regards of the work culture, I mean, as a student, uh, the culture differences might not be, um, let's say, too noticeable. I mean, despite language and access to different technologies, I think uh, most of the foreign students could relate somehow to how is to start over in a new place with new people. But how is uh, being a woman scientist, how would you describe the differences in the work culture, let's say, between America and here in Iceland? Um, if you're actually working, um, they are huge. Um, so to understand working in America, um, you have to kind of understand the class system there and also the work contract. And most Americans are hired on what is called, um, you know, the work to hire contract, which is sometimes referred to as the work to fire contract, which basically gives you two weeks notice at any point. So you can be fired you know, uh, with two weeks notice from most jobs. And um, if you are fired as an American, you will then lose your health insurance. Uh, and so if you have a family in particular, you are very much bound to your job. So the work environment there is, I would describe it as borderline fascist because everybody is, they won't admit it, but they are generally petrified of um, unemployment. And so they will do generally, they'll be very obedient to their boss, they'll do what they're told. And if they have a problem with you know, what they're being told to do, uh, they'll generally keep quiet about it. Uh, there are some very honorable exceptions to that, but that's the culture that's behind you know, these American behemoths that we're seeing like Facebook and Google and so on. And you know, the good and the bad that they're bringing to the world. Um, in Europe, in Iceland, and for that matter, in Canada, um, where I also worked for quite some time, uh, it's very different because you have the social safety net. And so, you know, there's in the work environment, certainly that I was in there, there's a healthy discussion about, you know, good decisions, bad decisions. You know, it's perfectly possible and indeed encouraged for an engineer to say, look, this is a really bad idea and for people to listen and change what's happening. Um, so, you know, there is a huge difference between the cultures of these different countries. 
That's that's very interesting. Also, you mentioned that you joined academia um, after uh, like a gap. So was it? I mean, I don't want to pinpoint it. Like, uh, was it a hard being a woman? But as as in general, was it hard to come back to academia again? But I, I was I, I'm assuming you were doing some kind of industrial job. Maybe then um, you joined back academia. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, I I worked in industry. I then went and did a PhD. I then went back to industry, and then I diverted back to the academy mainly because I was interested in developing sort of better economic theories. Um, and you know that was it, it was and still is a, a really interesting topic to uh, indulge myself in in understanding better. Um, I think it's difficult for anybody in the academy. I really do. Um, and I think, I'm not sure particularly at this time is the right word because I suspect it always has been. It's just that people are starting to talk about it a little more. Um, and I'm not sure personally where to sort of um, pinpoint, you know, what is female and what is just the world. I do feel that as women, you know, things were getting better up until the sort of 2000s was my general work experience and, and at university as well when I was back at MIT. And then things seemed to step back. Um, sort of the last 10 or 15 years, there seems to have been more pressure, discrimination towards women um, than there were before. Then you say that you observed um, a step back, uh, so in the middle of 2000s, I think. And yeah. so by this time, um, did you move from the industrial thing to uh, industrial, um, environment to the academia or, or did you, I mean, basically did you observe this step back in two different of our environments or only one? Um, so I graduated and yeah. graduated in 2006 from my PhD, which was an interesting time economically to graduate because you know, we know now that it's the beginning of the sort of the great crash that dominates mm -hmm. sort of 2008 to 10. Um, but of course, you don't know that at the time. And it seemed to me um, that there was just more sort of inappropriate behavior going on. And whereas when I was sort of an undergraduate and graduating and looking for a job, you'd sort of, you know, be treated as a um, bit of a unicorn um, because you was, you know, women, qualified women were so rare, you know, now, there was more sort of, you know, why should we even employ you as a woman kind of thing going on. Um, and, you know, even interview questions. And again, it's hard to say, because this might just be my personal experience. And also it's a sort of, you know, being in the States looking for a job versus more civilized countries like Canada and Iceland. Um, but there was more of this sort of stuff. And there was also more leakage, I think, from sort of, you know, there's a whole issue that, nobody talks about in this environment of sort of pornography influencing discourse. And I think that's was starting to leak in at the time looking back. Um, so it's hard to say. Um, generally also more, I think this is again, personal perception, more uh, focus on how you look for both men and women. So, you know, to get a job, you had to, you know, look look at look the right way whether that was close or whatever but also that's a sort of statement on are you you know female or male or the right color or whatever okay so in america okay so i mean as i understand i understand so you said that um the the whole mentality changed and it has yeah. several consequences but i mean one of them were uh between this uh, one of them was um about so the equality between men and women i mean so basic, I mean, if you want just to summarize very quickly, the thing that the mentality was changing. And so one of the things that men were basically acting in a bad way. Um, some men. I mean, never that, all men. And maybe, maybe there's a, the influence of internet uh, behind this, because I mean, in the middle of the, to the, the 2000s, it's basically the, the explosion of the internet. I mean, everyone, I mean, that by this time, I remember that, that uh, by this time that we, had for the first time internet in how how home in Brussels. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the internet has been both good and bad, and I think this was behind some of it. I think economic stress was behind some of it as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and and I will repeat again, it's never all men; it's some men. 
I did I, I did a calculation once. You know, let's assume that you know uh, one in a hundred guys, and you know there are one in a hundred females as well, uh, are rogue, and they go around abusing any woman they can. And you know, if they manage to abuse in some way, petty or major, one woman a week then basically with that frequency, the entire female population will have a bad experience on yeah. at least you know, once every two years. That's basically a Pareto law. So, base, yeah. so 20% of the population is responsible for 80% of the, uh, let's say, the car crash. I mean, we know that 20% yeah. of the driver is responsible for 80% of the car crash. I mean, that's always this kind of distribution we have. Exactly. Uh, and so that's why it's, um, okay, the, the important is not the average, the important is the extremum. That, that's really matter, in fact. But it's dangerous if we start, you know, characterizing everybody mm -hmm. um, on that on the basis of that small minority. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, yeah. That's that's a very important. And so that's also why. Um, I mean, on a topic that's linked, but it's not exactly the same. That's also why I don't really like the idea to put people in some groups because when you have, uh, I mean, when you have several groups, it's very easy to say that all the evil things. Uh, I mean, one group is responsible for all the evil things in the world, and that's very easy to, I mean, at some point you end up in this situation, and that's, uh, I mean, that's the history of, of the evil thing that happened in the last century, basically. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, although I do have a good American friend who's convinced that all major, current major problems in the world can be blamed on the British Empire, and you might be right about that, I don't know, but um, depends if you include America in that. Um, I think this grouping thing that we do instinctively probably has sort of its origins in adapting to forming, you know, good communicating networks and so on. But it can really go haywire if it, especially if it's used for propaganda purposes, as it often is, um, and if it's targeted against specific groups in society. And you know, that's a very dangerous phenomena and one that we all have to fight against. It's also not a, you know, a true phenomena. And any time, you know, you take people from different groups and mix them up and give them a chance to work together and really discover who they are, you know, these groups break down, you know, we can see that time and time again. So, you know, it's something we all need to fight against. Mm -hmm. yeah. I first have to apologize. I don't know what happened to my Zoom, but so in some way, I, I guess we can expect if we depend too much on technology, it can cause us some harms, but I'm glad that my like Rafael and Lupita, I hope you guys <laughs> continue the discussion because I have no idea my Zoom was froze and I couldn't do anything. But I, I don't even know that I could have finished this, uh, my question, what I was asking, because I started to ask and then I just, uh, I just saw that my screen is just like stopped working. So um, uh, the question I wanted to ask you uh, about when you said that you have seen more discrimination against women in the past 10 years. And so if we think about it, we are, we are kind of going to an era where people should have equal opportunities uh, despite of their gender and sex and everything. So it should be the opposite, right? Um, we should feel less discrimination against one particular gender. But also another discussion says that some ladies they feel or again, I would not put ladies in a highlight, some gender, they feel like it's more pressure on them right now. Like people are expecting things. When they give you the opportunities, they also start expecting things. How, how would you, what do you say about that? Um, my entire career, I've always felt under enormous pressure because I'm a woman. And ironically, that's probably why I've done as well as I have because rather than sort of ask anybody to help me, I just work away solving the problem myself, um, which, you know, reinforces itself over time, but not necessarily terribly efficiently. Um, but yes, I mean, if you're, I think anybody who's sort of um, not part of the dominant group, shall we say, and is, you know, given a chance, you know, and even told that sometimes, uh, then is put under a pressure to sort of succeed that other people don't feel. Um, and also they're sort of, stand, because they stand out, people give them more attention. So anything they do, whether it's good or bad, gets magnified. And, you know, if they do well, then yes, that's great. And they're sort of, you know, escalated. But if they make, you know, if they turn in normal performance, it can actually be looked at as bad. 
you know, just because, oh, well, they didn't, you know, exceed expectations or whatever, which is absolute nonsense. Um, I think, you know, I think the internet sort of has been good or bad, but, you know, it, it, we're in the middle of a huge broadcast storm at the moment as everybody suddenly gets access and starts discussing new ideas. It's very like sort of when the printing press was unleashed, there's a hundred years of chaos in Europe because a sort of formally very structured society is suddenly breaking loose of its bounds. And I think that's quite similar now. And there are economic stresses behind some of this. Um, you know, I think a lot of men do feel challenged, you know, because if you, if your picture of society is there's a few select places at the top and everybody's competing for them, then anybody else is sort of, you know, extra competition. You don't want that. If your picture of society is that the more people you have participating, the better it gets for everybody, then you don't mind. You want more people, you want more everybody to be educated and so on. But, you know, these two views tend to battle it out and we're still st stuck in sort of older 19th century hierarchical patterns in a lot of the world. Um, uh, I've, you know. uh, yeah, I have two, let's say two remarks. So, um, so first uh, about the question, um, uh, so, um, in fact, as long as you have um, some responsibility, you have some pressure. And so everyone has, is under pressure. I mean, it's not something special to one group or one other group. I mean, it's just everyone is under pressure. And so, as you said, uh, um, Jacqueline, at the beginning of this meeting, um, in the, acad the academia field is uh, quite, uh, I mean, it's a world with a, a huge pressure every, every time. And then, um, so about, yes, uh, so you, you just said that uh, if everyone is, I mean, uh, so there is few, um, I mean, let's say there is few, few seats, there is few positions at the top. And so everyone is just fighting to get this position. I'm not exactly sure about that because, I mean, so everyone, I mean, every individual has, um, has its own motivations and it can be very different. And so I don't think uh, everyone is fighting for this top position, for example, uh, I'm not fighting to become a CEO because I know that, I mean, the CEO of a multinational enterprise, it's something, it's a position with a lot of pressure. I mean, this kind of guy that are working, working a, a lot. I mean, and that's not exactly my, my um, I mean, it's not exactly my goal. On, uh, I mean, my goal to have this top position, working a lot, having maybe a lot of money, but don't even uh, have time to, uh, I mean, to appreciate my life. And so I'm not sure that everyone is fighting for the top position, but maybe I've just misunderstood what, misunderstood what you just said. Yeah, a little. Uh, I mean, I wasn't actually thinking of CEOs. I was, I remember, um, I come from the UK. Yeah. So the UK has been characterized, actually, for, I think, you know, longer than even the fall of the empire by high unemployment. <laughs> so when I'm talking about guys getting worried about, you know, their position, what they're worried about is having any job at all. Oh, okay. Right. And if you're a, a guy and, you're, and you feel responsible for your family, which is, again, English cultural conditioning, um, and, you know, you're worried about getting a job and now there's, you know, women or for that matter, Europeans. I mean, this was not acknowledged as much as it should have been, but this was a lot of the impetus behind Brexit. Um, then, yes, this is something that you'll fight back up against with, you know, any tool that you can handle, including, mm -hmm. you know, Internet hassling. Um, I think that is a consideration and, you know, in the sort of scientific, you know, competitions there, you know, we, and in, and in other realms as well, um, you know, people cheat, you know, it, it's, you know, in any competition, right, it's, you know, not necessarily that, you know, people are just going to play by the rules. If you're convinced that your scientific answer is right, and, you know, science is actually structured as a competition of, you know, who can find the best or rightest answer. Um, you know, cheating is fine. It's part of, you know, the how you succeed. Um, and that certainly goes on. We can observe it in, in science. It's also a matter of record now that, you know, if you submit things with a female name, you'll have a, a lower acceptance rate, lower acceptance rate for grants, lower acceptance rates for papers. Nothing here is talking about the scientific truth of those papers. And that's a problem for society. You know, it's a problem if the right scientific answer isn't being found by the sort of collective mind of academia, just because some groups are being discriminated against. And especially when those groups might well have, you know, other information to bring to the, the floor, as it were, because 
you know, if you think about sort of science as, you know, also a sensor network, every scientist is operating on their local information and trying to solve the problems based on that and contribute to the whole. Um, ignoring any part of that is problematic um, in any field. Yeah, when you say that um, um, there is, uh, I mean, if you submit a paper with a female name, you have a, a lower probability to get accepted. Um, I, I would say that's uh, a little bit surprising since, I mean, from my experience, but I don't have as influence as you, but from my experience, most of the time, the, uh, the um, so you submit a paper, but the reviewers, it's, I mean, the review, it's anonymous. So the, I mean, the reviewer doesn't know the name of the, of the author of the paper is reviewing. In theory, in practice, um, most fields are very small. You know, the, the sort of subfields and sub, 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 sub fields, I would say these days. So the reality of sort of the discussion within that subfield is generally people know who wrote the paper, right? Uh, once you get it sort of up to this, uh, the sort of professional level, certainly. Um, <clears throat> again, thanks to the internet, it's usually pretty trivial to de-anonymize people if you want to. Um, you know, most of the anonymized papers I review, if you look for them, you can find out who wrote them. Um, just by, you know, they'll have already been posted on archive or, you know, that style of writing will re resonate with you. Um, I mean, you know, it's hard to pinpoint. I mean, there are, you know, there are papers written and, you know, just examining the broad statistics and they certainly support what I've just said. My personal experience, I've been invited to be part of two economic citation rings. One of them was led by a female and one of them was led by a male. So make of that what you will. Um, I don't think either group was particularly interested in doing what I would call good science. Um, but, you know, they were successful scientists. They were publishing a lot and, you know, getting citations. Uh, people cheat, you know, it's, uh, we're a multifaceted species, I would say. Um, well, and, you know, um... capitalism succeeds basically by, you know, trying to uh, give everybody a chance to compete. Yeah. On that note, I would say, um, like what Rafael said, like, of course, everyone have their different motives to be uh, on certain position. It's not might be the CEO or anything, but I think what expected and what we should do is doesn't matter what their destination is, given everyone the same opportunity to get there. Yeah, and, definitely. Great. and um, if I don't want to be a CEO, it's fine. But if three people, in respite of their gender, want to be a CEO, just give them the same chances. Yeah. And then no. they'll decide. Um, I totally agree. And by the way, the job of CEO completely sucks. I wouldn't want it either. <laughs> uh, <Me> neither. <laughs> but you know, as a society, yeah, we we should give everybody the same chances and we should try to select the best people, not the best people by birth or the best people by, you know, inherited income or whatever. Because if you have people, well, you know, the UK government is a really good example right now. Um, if you have people who aren't very good at the job put into it because of, you know, non-competent reasons, as it were, um, it tends to be disastrous, especially if it's a responsible position. Um, you know, and there's a lot of decisions, you know, I mean, you know, sort of decision making, you know, at any level, um, there are a lot of small decisions you're making all the time that can be very important. Um, and if you have people who aren't that competent making them, it tends to be somewhat disastrous. You know, and Chernobyl is an example of that, um, you know, the current brinkmanship in the Ukraine is likely to be an example if everybody's not very careful. You know, I mean, we're all right now, basically at the mercy of, you know, captains and lieutenants of artillery in Russia and the Ukraine not lobbing a shell over to Chernobyl. That's sorry, a current reality. So, you know. Yeah. Scary. Yeah, seriously. Okay, well, from so my side, I have no questions. <laughs> I think we will, we will end because we are running out of time on this very positive remark, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, I mean, everything is not positive in life, so. Yeah. On a positive note, uh, let's lend on something positive, because we should. Yeah. This is the richest, most successful, most scientifically advanced point in our, his, our species history. And we've come further and faster in the last 20 years than anybody could have dreamed. And that is because of equality and diversity, right? We've gone from very segregated societies 100 years ago to at least trying, however imperfectly, to, you know, include women, include men, include all the races, 
in sort of, you know, human development. And yeah, this is a work in progress and we're not going to see it ending. It's going to take another 100 or 200 years, but, you know, we're well on the way. And the reward is, as I said, the most advanced scientific period of our time. And, you know, things can probably only get better um, because, you know, we really are making incredible steps and, you know, science is just, things are just rolling out so fast now um, that, you know, I think the next 20 years will probably leave the last 20 years in the dust from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, 100 years ago, we had a small collection of scientists that were educated from mostly the rich upper classes and any really, really bright kid they could find in the sort of, you know, entry level schools. Uh, and now we're basically educating in most countries anybody we can, you know, and there's millions of scientists now as opposed to a few thousand. Um, so it's just, you know, it's, it's difficult when you're in the middle of things to sort of just step back and see progress. It's, it's still slow in terms of our daily lives, but it's equally, it's quite fast. That's a very nice note to end uh, this episode. And that's positive. Uh, that's positive. Yeah, let's let's stay positive, and if nothing is better, we can make it better. We can. Oh, yes. We really can. Yes. We're the human race. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, for for today, it was a really nice conversation and some really uh, insightful topics that we've discussed today. And hopefully, again, um, we can continue our discussion. Hopefully, yeah. yeah thank you for inviting really me. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye uh, for today and check out our next episode and first this episode. Look forward to it. Thank you Bye-bye. Bye.